Good morning. I said this last week, the four of you that were here heard me say this, but I thought it'd be worth repeating how excited I am about Camp Zephyr. Uh, I went to Camp Zephyr as a kid, and my wife went to Camp Zephyr, and my, shoot, my mother went to Camp Zephyr. That's how long Camp Zephyr's been around. You, you, you can hardly, you can hardly, uh, well, I'll just leave it at that. We, I'm excited about Camp Zephyr. I'm excited about my kids. I still have high school and middle school kids who, who get to enjoy Camp Zephyr. I think my two older kids that are adults now, I think they, they even went to Camp Zephyr. So anyway, if you haven't been, uh, if your kid hasn't been, you should get them signed up. We need to get behind this and support this. I am excited about Camp Zephyr. I feel like we're a legit church now because we're going to Camp Zephyr. That's weird that I think that, but that's how I feel. So um, we are continuing this sermon series, and I want to get you caught up because some of you haven't heard many or perhaps none of the sermons that I have preached in this series leading up to today. Uh, so, so here's what's going on. We're preaching through the book of Philemon. Philemon is a book that the Apostle Paul wrote. He wrote it in prison. Um, there's some differences of opinion according to, uh, by different scholars, but, but he was probably in Rome. Most, most scholars believe he was in Rome. There's some reasons to believe why he might have been elsewhere, but nonetheless, he was, he was imprisoned, and he wrote several letters, uh, two letters. The two letters that we're studying now into the spring are the, the, the letters to Philemon and to the church in Colossae, the, the, what we know as the book of Colossians. And I've said this before, but I'm just so intrigued by the thought that, that there was this faithful <clears throat> minister, uh, faithful partner in ministry to the Apostle Paul uh, who, who left the, this, this prison with a couple of scrolls in his knapsack, and little did he know that thousands of years later we would be studying those same two scrolls, those same two letters. I'm just, just fascinated by the, the providence of God in that, uh, that moment. Uh, this isn't part of the sermon, but let me just say that, that, that perhaps some of the menial tasks that you are fulfilling today Perhaps something that you're going to do this week that seems uh, rather insignificant, uh, perhaps in God's providence, it will be the most significant thing that you will do in your life. Some conversation, some transaction, some decision, some influence that you have over some person this week that might seem insignificant as a part of what you might consider an insignificant life, think on the fact that it might be used in some profound, eternal fashion, just like the, uh, we, have, we, we can speculate, but just like the anonymous person who, who carried those two scrolls out of the prison cell to Philemon and to the church in Colossae. I've said this before, but it's worth repeating the book of Philemon is not oft preached. Uh, several reasons why it's not often preached, perhaps, are because it's so short. It's only one chapter, so we just call it a we just call it a letter. It doesn't have it doesn't have chapter numbers because there's only one. It just has verse numbers. Um, it is it is perhaps uh, not studied uh, very often because it is a very private letter. It's a very personal letter. It's written to Philemon about a private matter. And the third reason why it's often not preached is because, uh, because uh, Paul's uh, exact intention, specifically what he's asking Philemon to do, um, is somewhat unclear. Now, the general intention is clear, and we've been talking about that. We're going to continue talking about that. But this, this specific, the, the, the sort of elephant in the room, this very specific intention is Paul asking Philemon to release his, his slave, his Christian slave, from slavery? Or is he just asking him to be a better slave master to his slave, Onesimus? That's the question which goes unanswered. I think there are great implications in the letter, but the specific answer to that question does not, 
uh, does not get answered, and I believe that Paul did not answer that question on purpose because the Bible is given to us on an as-need-to-know basis. Let's talk about the, uh, the background and the story of Philemon, and then we'll jump in today's, into today's <clears throat> section. Let me just remind you um, that, that the book of Philemon, uh, of course, Philemon is a dude, and he is the addressee. He is the recipient of this letter. It's written to two, specifically to Philemon, and yet it does say, and to the church that meets in your house. Like I said a few weeks ago, it's like if, I, if, if, if you had a very private sin in your life, and, and I, I came to you in a very personal matter, I said, hey, brother, I, wanted, I, want, I, want, I want you to deal with this, and by the way, on Sunday morning, I'm going to get up and I'm going to tell everybody. It's kind of like that. He wrote this letter. It's a private letter to Philemon, but he also addresses it to the church that meets in Philemon's house. Why? Because our private sins and our private lives, if we choose to be a part of the body of Christ, which you have by your very attendance, our, our private lives and our private sin, if you choose to be a part of this community of faith, then what's private becomes public. That is the way that Jesus has set up, designed kononia, this fellowship, the, the, the community that we, um, that we call our church. So Philemon is the addressee, and he's apparently a man of wealth, and privilege, and Onesimus, uh, Onesimus was his slave. Now, I, I want to say this every week, and I want to, you to hear this uh, really clearly. Slavery in the Bible cannot be justified. Slavery in the Bible was, was uh, a, a robbing, at least uh, to some degree, a robbing of a human being's dignity, value, and worth. And we as Christ followers believe that because we are created in God's image, every human being, young and old, of all different races, the privileged and the unprivileged, the free and the incarcerated, every human being is born in God's image, created in God's image, and has dignity, value, and worth. And so, and so the, the, the slavery in the Bible is a robbing of a person's dignity and value and worth. And, and yet, what I want to say is you cannot equate, you cannot equate slavery in the Bible with slavery in the antebellum South, which is a part of our, our, our tragic history as a country. They're, they're not the same. There's similarities, but they're not the same. And if you want to do a deep dive into how they're different, there's a lot of really good resources that I can give you, and you can read on the differences. <clears throat> I am not in any way condoning slavery in the Bible. I just want you to understand that we're not talking about the exact same system. In fact, as I said last week, uh, most scholars, most historians would say that, that roughly 20% of the Roman world in Paul's day was enslaved in some way. That doesn't justify it, but I just want you to understand it, it was quite common. There are, there are um, and I'll call, it, I'll call it tragic, there are examples uh, in history and literature of people um, voluntarily going into slavery that they might pay off a debt uh, because they would rather be enslaved than unemployed. Uh, in the Roman world in that day, uh, in the caste system, the lowest rung on that class system or that caste system was not, in fact, slavery. Um, to be destitute, to be unemployed, uh, and yet free was considered a lower class of existence in that day and, and certainly would have presented uh, physical hardships uh, more physical hardships than the life of a slave, because at least uh, the slave, though he was robbed of his dignity, value, and worth, at least he had uh, some means of income. Okay, so a little more of the backstory. Onesimus <clears throat> had evidently um, run away from Philemon, his, 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 his master, 
Philemon, by the way, Philemon, uh, the slave owner, was a Christian. He had come to faith under Paul's teaching. <clears throat> Onesimus, Onesimus had, had run away from Colossae. He'd run to wherever Paul was. We're going to say Rome. He'd run to Paul, run to Rome, met him in prison. Uh, Onesimus came to faith, apparently, at that moment in time, under, under Paul's uh, direction. And now Paul is sending Onesimus back to Philemon. That seems ominous. That seems uh, intimidating. Uh, we might even question the, 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 uh, the wisdom in that. But Philemon, uh, Paul is sending Onesimus back to Philemon. And Paul's request is that Philemon simply receive Onesimus back. And so this entire letter tells us how Philemon is to receive Onesimus back. So really it's a letter of reconciliation, a letter about reconciliation. In last week's reading, some of you heard the sermon, maybe online or, or in person. In last week's um, reading, Paul, the Apostle Paul, sought to persuade Philemon to do the right thing in, in receiving Onesimus back. But, but he wanted Philemon to do the right thing of his own accord. Without, without compulsion, without being bullied by Paul, Paul makes it clear, Philemon, I want you to do the right thing out of love. Paul says, I have no, I have no interest in commanding you to receive Onesimus back as a brother in Christ now with full dignity, value, and worth. Uh, I, I have no interest in, in commanding you to do so, uh, strong-arming you. I want you to do it out of love. This is a request. Remember, he says things like, I'm an old man. Uh, I'm, I'm in prison. I have no you know, real authority. I'm just, I'm just asking you as an old man to a brother in Christ, would you, would you would you consider doing this? Then the main point, actually, of last week's study, uh, Paul states in, in a guarded and careful way, because we always want to be guarded, and we always want to be careful when we start speculating on God's will, on God's providence in any person's life. You, we've all had people speak too quickly into our lives about God's will, and, and that can be painful. So Paul does it in a guarded way, in a careful way. He says, perhaps... That, that's, that's in the text. Perhaps, possibly, he says, possibly, perhaps, Philemon, perhaps God may have brought this separation between you and Onesimus to pass for a brief time that he might ultimately reunite you for eternity as brothers in Christ. And we talked last week about God possibly bringing good out of your own disappointment in life. And, and several of you said, boy, I really related to that. I really, I really, that's where I'm at. I really can connect with that. Uh, I want to see how God might be shaping and forming my future for my good out of disappointment. And the last summary statement I'll make from last week's sermon is this, and that is God cares more about your heart. God, God cares about your circumstances, but He cares more about your heart. With all of that as summary, let's jump in now to our new reading for the week, and we're going to reread two verses, and then all the rest of the material is new. Philemon, beginning with verse 15. This is all in the body of the letter. You know, we, we looked at the, at the opening greeting, the thanksgiving, and then last week and this week we're looking at the body of the letter. If you've written a letter, you know what I'm talking about. Like, this is the meat of the letter. Last week was the appeal, part one. This week is the appeal, part two. Join me as I read out loud. You follow along silently. Philemon, verse 15. <clears throat> Again, these two verses we read last week. 
Paul says to Philemon, perhaps the reason he, Onesimus, was separated you, separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back forever. No longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. <clears throat> he is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. So if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back. It's like an I owe you. I will pay it back, not to mention that you owe me your very self. Verse 20, I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. A little test. What's the Greek word for heart? Oh, come on. Splank now. Remember? Refresh my heart, my, my guts, my inner being. Give me, give me some encouragement here, he says. Refresh my heart. 21, confident in your obedience. I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I ask. Verse 22, and one thing more, prepare a guest room for me, because I hope to be restored to you in answer to your prayers. The word of the Lord for which I give thanks. All right, so this week we pick up where we left off last week. I'm going to go right to verse 17. Verse 17 is considered by uh, theologians, scholars, uh, to be the main point of Paul's request. He says, if you consider me a partner, what does he mean by that? A partner in ministry, um, deep friendship for a lifetime. What, what does he mean? He says, if you consider me a partner Welcome Onesimus as you would welcome me. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. <clears throat> we need to look back to verse 16. I think we have the verse 16 uh, to see the nuance of his request. He's saying, receive Onesimus as though he were me. Receive him as you would receive me. And then he says, well, prior to that, he had just finished saying, no longer is a slave, but better than a slave as a dear brother. There's this triangle of relationship, and he's saying, I'm your brother in Christ. Onesimus, he's my brother in Christ. Would you receive Onesimus as your brother in Christ the way you would receive me as your brother in Christ? Co-equals. Members of God's family, people of dignity, value, and worth. Now, notice in this, in this verse... That, that Paul does not say, no longer a slave. And obviously, this is the Greek, uh, I mean, this is the English translation that we're dealing with, but it, it's an accurate way of, 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 of interpreting here. He's saying, he, he doesn't say, um, no longer a slave. What does he say? He says, no longer as a slave. So, some would say that Paul is not expressly condemning slavery here. Um, and some people don't like that. They, they wish that he would have said, receive him back, no longer a slave. And he doesn't exactly say that. He says, no longer as a slave. In fact, in Paul's other writings, several places we have um, <clears throat> what, what people in modern day refer to as Paul's household uh, codes. It's, it's especially um, um, detailed in Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to look at a little bit of that here in a minute. But, but Paul gives us these household codes. 
You know how, how children are to relate to their parents, how a husband is to relate to his wife, how a wife is to relate to his husband. But then he gets into, in these household codes, how a, um, a, a, a slave owner, as uncomfortable as that makes us, how a slave owner is to relate to his slaves and a slave is to relate to slave owners. And he doesn't expressly say, just cut that out completely, but rather he gives them instructions for how to deal with one another in dig- with nig- dignity, value, and worth. Uh, verse 5 of chapter 6, it says this. Again, this is Ephesians, but this is just an example of how Paul would write about these household, cl- uh, household codes. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with deep respect and fear. Serve them with sincerity as you would serve Christ. Verse 6, try to please them all the time, not just when they are watching. As slaves of Christ, do the will of God with all your heart. Notice how he, he moves from the literal slavery to this metaphor that he uses all the time about how we are to come under the lordship of Christ. He uses this metaphor all the time, that we are slaves of Christ. So he's speaking literally, you're a slave, please your, 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 your boss, and then he speaks figuratively, we are slaves of Christ, um, doing the will of God with all our heart. Verse 7, work with enthusiasm. Now he's back to the literal. Work with enthusiasm as though you were working for the Lord rather than, than for people. Remember that the Lord will reward each one of you, us for the good we do, whether we are slaves or free. And then verse 9, verse 9 He says, masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Don't threaten them. Remember, you both have the same master in heaven. Get this. And he has no favorites. And he has no favorites. As I prayed for you this morning, as I prepared to preach this sermon, I I became keenly aware that that this passage and today's sermon is for those of us who struggle with the sense that we're better than others. Now, we hide it well. You're probably particularly crafty. We are probably particularly crafty such that we would never tell anyone this, but you, you walk into a room and, and you just can't help it. There's a sense of, I'm, I'm better than a lot of these people. Or maybe there's a sense of, I just, I know things other people don't know. I'm smarter than a lot of people. And the innocuous nature of that sort of mindset for anyone, but I'm speaking to a room of Christians, the innocuous um, <clears throat> not innocuous, the insidious nature of that of, of that of that mindset is 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 that that, that it creates a bear a a, 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 a a wall, a a, a separation, uh, isolation. It just gets down deep in us and and there's no longer anyone to relate to because if I think that I'm better than others, if I, I think that I got something on other people, then it, I, 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 I isolate myself. I wait till I can find someone who I can actually relate to, is actually on my level. And so Paul is talking to slaves and slave masters, and he ends with this interesting statement, God has no favorite. So while in this passage, while he is, while he is, um, he is not expressly saying, uh, Christian masters, release all your Christian slaves, I have to ask, since Paul is encouraging Philemon to receive Onesimus as a dear brother, is there really any room left for him to treat him as a slave? 
It, it seems as though Paul is doing a crafty job of, of condemning slavery in the sense that it's no longer tenable. If we are brothers and sisters in Christ, we are co-equal. God has no favorites. How can we treat one another as though I'm better than you or you're better than me? I'm special and you're not, or I'm educated and you're not, or you're wealthy and I'm not. And, and, and Paul, just, I believe, creates a crafty way, rhetorical sort of argument saying, ultimately, can you really have a slave? Professor, scholar, uh, Dr. Douglas Moo says this, and we find many examples in history, in secular history, many examples of strong mutual affection between master and slave in the ancient world. Moreover, granting a slave his or her freedom was not always an unqualified good thing for the freed slaves cut off from the household of which they had been a part often had a difficult time finding a way to make a living. Again, it's not, it's not appropriate or even healthy for us to completely superimpose what we see as slavery on this text. Nonetheless, nonetheless, Paul does seem to be making this case of how can we look at one another as though we have different classes, a a caste system, when God doesn't see us that way at all. So, it is good for us, this is not the main point of today's sermon, but it is good for us to think deeply as Christians, to think deeply on this very raw, difficult topic, and that is slavery. How, how, does, how does a Christian view this robbing of one's dignity, value, worth? Because we live in the 21st century in the United States, we don't deal openly with slavery, but how might we be living in and among some sort of informal caste or class system in which we decide that some people are significant and others are not? Continuing on, Paul's, um, <clears throat> Paul's in, in, today's, in today's little section, Paul's appeal is now Uh, more than the verses that we've read before. His appeal is now expressed in plain terms. He was was being careful and and guarded and and, and, and humble in the opening uh, eight or ten verses, maybe even the first 15 or 16 verses. Today, he lands the plane with with four very clear imperatives, instructions, requests, I want you to do these four things for me, Onesimus. Four things that I'm asking you. I'm an old man. I'm in prison. I can't, I can't make you, but would you consider doing these four things? And here they are. Number one, he says, welcome Onesimus as you would welcome me. If you consider me a partner, he says, if you consider me a brother in Christ, you'd welcome me. You'd welcome me, wouldn't you? Well, Onesimus, uh, he's a brother in Christ. Welcome him. He's your brother in Christ. Welcome him the way that you would welcome me. The point is, folks, Christians, us, we are are obligated if we are Christians. you, you, You don't have to be a Christ follower, but if you're going to follow Christ, we are obligated to welcome those whom God welcomes. We are obligated to welcome those whom God welcomes. Professor N.T. Wright says this, No Christian has a right to refuse a welcome to one whom God has welcomed. Faith in Christ, the basis of our justification, is the basis also of koinonia. You know that word, this, this fellowship. Justification by faith must result in fellowship by faith. If, if there is some separation, there is some schism, there is some, um, there is some separation between you and another brother or sister in Christ, then you're obligated to, to work on that. That is, 
That is a point of sin in your life. We are obligated to welcome those whom God welcomes. I've said that, that there are four imperatives. The first one is, is, is what we just said. Welcome Onesimus as you would welcome me. The second imperative is this. Charge his debts to me. Put them on my bill, the Apostle Paul says. For Onesimus' sake, Paul becomes a debtor to Philemon, even though he owes Philemon nothing. In fact, he's going to make a case, really, Philemon, you kind of owe me. But here I'm going to, I'm going to uh, voluntarily write you an IOU. It's impossible to say for certain if Onesimus um, had, had uh, stolen from Philemon. But it would be odd for Paul to make this offer if he did not have some concrete evidence that Onesimus had wronged Philemon in, in some clear manner, perhaps stealing property. Um, and from, from Philemon's point of view, this may have been the most painful part of the matter. I mean, yeah, he's, he's a slave owner and we can judge him for that perhaps, but, but perhaps this was the, the hardest part. If you've ever been stolen from, especially if it was an acquaintance or a, or a friend or, or, or an employee, if you've ever been stolen from, you know that the unique pain that goes along with that. And so Paul offers this IOU. I will pay you back for Onesimus' wrongdoing. How often as Christians do we take that, that, um, that position for the sake of another person? It's hard. A few times a year maybe, or if not, just maybe a few times in your life, you have this clear opportunity to, to carry another's burdens, to say, look, how he has wronged you, whatever he owes you, put that on my, on my debt. That's a hard... And yet this position... Uh, it's, it's, it's the position that the gospel, the story of Jesus, takes regarding us. 2 Corinthians 5 says this, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of Christ. We refer to this as the great exchange. God took our sin and our debt and he, he put it on Christ. And, and God took Christ's righteousness and he, he placed it on us no, that, so that he no longer sees us as debtors. He now sees us as the righteous. So this, this taking on of another person's debt though it's not your responsibility, it is Christ-like. And that's what, <clears throat> that's what the Apostle Paul is doing. To offer a lost world in our day, us, to offer a lost world only condemnation, only judgment, is, is not like Christ. If I am burdened by evil, I am called to work for reconciliation. And that sometimes will cost me a lot. And then going on, going on in Paul's writing, in verse 19, notice what he, notice what he says, Paul, uh, I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. It's like, like if we sit here, I'm going to write you an IOU. So I'm, I'm, I'm writing this in my own hand. I will pay it back. And then he has to throw this in. This is extra. This isn't really part of the sermon. It's just, it's just cute or, or, or funny or clever. So I'll, it says, not to mention that you owe me your very self. Right? What is that? It's this, this, this rhetorical trick where you say, like, I'm not going to mention it. And then you mention it, right? In the not mentioning it, you get to throw it in and mention it. He's like, not to mention the fact that you owe me a lot, Philemon. Again, I've said this before, and this is not the way to read the Bible, but, but even if you aren't a Christ follower, if you want a lesson on how to write a good letter of persuasion, this, this Philemon, this, this letter of Philemon is 
just that. And then verse 20, verse 20 he says, I do wish, brother, <clears throat> that I may have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. And I think this is the last time he uses this. We've looked at three different um, three different uses, three different examples of this word heart um, in, in, in this brief letter. It shows up very few times in like all of the rest of, of Paul's writings, his letters, comparatively. But it's three times here when he talks about my, like Onesimus last week. Onesimus is my very heart. Today he says, would, find me, would, you, would you do this for me? And in so doing, would you refresh my heart? heart. Oh, that I might experience this heartfelt joy, Philemon, in seeing you guys reconciled in Christ. This morning, um, you, us, most of us, we're looking for something to make our lives feel meaningful. And I have to say that if you read the story of Jesus, if you read the gospel, if you read the New Testament, there is refreshment and significance to be found in being a reconciler, bringing people together who were, who were formally separated. There is deep joy and there is deep significance to be found. Paul says, this would, make, this would just make my heart glad if you would do this. It reminds me of another character in the Bible, Paul's good friend, Barnabas. Um, we don't have time to, to really explore that today, but you've heard me preach on Barnabas. And Barnabas is one of my favorite guys in the Bible because he, he's a reconciler. He, he's always bringing people together. He's always like, come on, we're going to get in this room. We're going to work this out. We're going to make this work. We're going to talk through this because we're brothers in Christ. We're the family of God. We're going to make this work. And Paul says, if you would do this, this would <clears throat> refresh my heart. And that's the third, that's the third um, request that he makes, that he would refresh his heart in the Lord. And then... In verse 21, we're about done here. In verse 21, he says this, Confident of your obedience, I write to you, know that you knowing that you will do even more than I ask. Now think on that for a second. The even more than I ask. It seems to beg this question. It, could he be talking about emancipate, about liberating Onesimus from slavery? Could he be talking about it without talking about it? Could he be saying, I know you're going to do what I ask. I know you're going to even do more than I ask. Could he be alluding to this idea that maybe Philemon will actually release Onesimus from slavery? There's some, there's some reason to believe that, that Paul is hoping, hoping that Philemon might release Onesimus completely and send him back that he might work with Paul in ministry. And then finally, his last request is this. This is the one. This is my favorite one. His last request is, uh, Philemon, make up a bed for me in your spare room because I'm, I'm coming to visit. I'm going to come see you. And what do I get out of this? I get out of this a real commitment on Paul's part to invest his time, his calendar, his, his schedule in seeing fellowship and seeing reconciliation happen. He isn't just ordering from afar, saying, you guys work it out, I don't have time to come see you. He's like, I'm coming to your neighborhood. I'm coming for a visit. When someone asks me for some deep uh, course correction, asks me to consider a new direction, but they're not willing to invest their own schedule, their own skin in the game, then I, you know, uh, maybe I'm not going to consider, but, but when, you, when you ask me to consider something, you're like, and, I'll, and I'm right there with you. Like, I'll go with you. I will, uh, shoulder to shoulder, we're going to get through this. Then, then that, that says something. And that's what Paul is doing here. 
And, and in so doing, Paul is taking the gospel, the story of Jesus, the, 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 the doctrine of justification, and he's, in a, he's applying it to everyday life. Ultimately, that is what maturity in Christ looks like. Maturity in Christ, growing up in Jesus, is not, it's not knowing, uh, being able to recite every book of the Bible, oh, that's cool. It's not, it's not knowing exactly where to go for any, the answer to any question, and, although that's really, that's really awesome. Maturity in Christ is really what's going on here. Taking the, the doctrine of justification that I am now the righteousness of Christ and applying it to your relationships. So Paul says to Philemon, Welcome Onesimus as you would welcome me. Charge his debts to my bill. Refresh my heart and get ready for my upcoming visit. And what Paul doesn't do in this entire letter, he doesn't major on the point of condemning Philemon for having a slave. He doesn't take a negative position in any way. He enters into this relationship between Philemon, not to bring condemnation, but to bring reconciliation. And that, dear friends, is our role in this world, not to be agents of condemnation, but agents of reconciliation, just like Jesus. In John chapter 3, verse 17, it says, For God did not send Jesus into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Does our sin and our rejection of God condemn us? Yes. Did Jesus come to condemn us? No. He came to save us. And there's a larger lesson here, and that is how Christians, when condemning evil, become responsible parties in bringing about healing and reconciliation. Let me say that again. As a Christ follower, when you condemn evil, which you should in appropriate ways, you are now on the hook, responsible for for bringing healing and and reconciliation. When condemning evil, we are compelled to bring an alternative to a lost and dying world. Paul did just that. If we're going to call sin, sin, which we should, if we're going to call sin, sin, then we should be able to offer a gospel solution that is more attractive than the sin that our friend is already attracted to, or really we should be silent. What evils do we commonly as Christ followers condemn today? In in modern day world, in 21st century, what sins do we uh, commonly condemn? And there's a real honest answer to that question. It's the sin and the evil that we don't struggle with. And why is that? Because That way we personally, as Christ followers, don't have to be a part of the solution. We don't have to be a part of, uh, clean up the mess. It's just easy to condemn the big sins that we're never tempted by anymore, that we we no longer consider engaging in. We, We condemn those. We're not called agents of condemnation by Paul. We're called agents of reconciliation. How often are we willing to be a part of the condemnation side of the equation, but we miss out on the responsibility to be reconcilers? And the world sees that, and the world sees through the hypocrisy of that, and and the world often hates that, our willingness to condemn, but our lack of time and our our, our lack of of willingness to to move into the neighborhood and to show up on the doorstep and to be a part of cleaning up the mess. Paul took his time. Paul made a case. Paul planned a visit. Paul forged a solution. Paul was invested. 
These last few things I'm going to say are going to maybe maybe be um, a bit a bit hard to hear, a bit controversial. But but we choose we choose if if, if we're going to choose to condemn, then we are also as Christ followers choosing to be a part of the solution. As a as a person um, as a person who struggles with that with that. Difficulty, that tension every day. I want us to call us to, to, to a new way. If we are going to uh, call out and condemn the tragedy of abortion, for instance, then, then we as Christ followers are compelled to be a part of the solution, be it, be it uh, adoption, be it affordable health care, be it a part of moving into the neighborhood figuratively or literally or whatever that means for you. If we as Christ's followers are going to call out our neighbors and our friends when it, when it comes to um, when it comes to a loose lifestyle or when it comes to immorality, then we are responsible for creating a place within the church where people can find relationship and, and intimacy and, and, and confidentiality and, and what their heart really yearns for. If we are going to, as Christ followers, call out our friends for their poor decisions, for their, for their dumb mistakes, their, their chronic <clears throat> patterns, then we have to be a part of the solution. Agents of reconciliation, not merely agents of condemnation. As Christians, we are called to, and this is the summary, and then we're going to run to the table of, G, to the table of communion because it's, it's Jesus that, that offers us the, the power to do what, what I'm calling us to do today. We don't have it in ourselves. Summary, as Christians, <clears throat> we are called to, number one, lead out in reconciliation. If that's not an everyday, if that doesn't mark you, then, then you are not living under the lordship of Jesus Christ. We are, we are called to lead out in reconciliation. Number two, we are called to take, the, to take responsibility for things that are not our fault. That's what husbands do in, in, in the family. That's what, what wives, what mothers do. And if it, all the time, we, we say, I didn't, I didn't create this mess, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fix it. That's what you do at work at times. That you do, that's what you do with a, with a brother or sister in Christ who's struggling and made a mess of their lives. We, we, just like Jesus did, he took responsibility for things that weren't his fault, namely our sin. We, as Christ's followers, are called to do the same. Number three, we're called to find deep joy in seeing light fill the darkness of our world. Oh, that we might, that, that, our, that our hearts, that our inner, inner parts might, might be filled with joy as we see God pushing back the darkness in our own space, in our own community, in our own world. And number four, we are called to be among the people, not to live virtually, not to live isolated, not to live um, on our computers, but to really be among the people. <clears throat> Paul is brilliant, uh, obviously. Uh, what, what does he do rather than judgmentally condemn this sin of slavery? What does he do? Instead, he esteems the dignity and the value and the worth of Onesimus, a slave, thereby undercutting the very lie that fuels slavery, that some people are worth more than others. It's a brilliant, it's a brilliant argument. Amen. Let us pray. God, we come to you this morning wanting that you would give us tender hearts toward one another, tender hearts toward
our brothers and sisters in Christ, and also tender hearts toward the world. God, as we, probably every one of us, as we struggle at times with pride and arrogance and judgment and a sense of, of being better than others, God, would you give us a tender-hearted understanding of what it means that, that you have no favorites? What a, what a beautiful statement. And, and if I can talk to you directly, folks, as you just keep, continue to have your head bowed, I think one of the things that means is that, that when you look at others who you think maybe are better than you, I think what you need to hear this morning is that, that God loves you deeply and tenderly and, and wholly, not, not based on what you've done for Him, he loves you just because He chooses to love you. He has no favorites. He, he doesn't love somebody else because he or she's a better Christian or more brilliant or, or more uh, successful than you know. God, God has no favorites. God, God loves you. He esteems you. He sings and dances over you this morning. And so we rest in that, God. We rest in that, in that place of knowing that, that you love us and that we are your children. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.